All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to what is our final um, quarterly webinar for 2022. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen here. Give me a second while I do that. But while sharing my screen, I just want to say it has been an amazing, amazing two years. They do say time flies when you are having fun, and it has sure been super fun working on the Open Mainframe Project COBOL programming course with this amazing team um, that is our TSC, the Technical Steering Committee team. My name is Sudarshana Srinivasan. I work for IBM as an advocacy program manager and also part of the COBOL programming course, uh, Open Mainframe Project. Thrilled to be part of the Open Mainframe Project and specifically driving adoption for COBOL by providing this amazing open source version of COBOL learning content. Um, I have the joy of co-chairing this, um, this programming course with Mike Bauer from Broadcom. Mike, take it away. Thanks, Sudarshna. Um, I'm Michael Bauer. I'm a product manager for Broadcom working in the mainframe software division. Um, I'm mostly focused on uh, DevOps and in the open source community, I'm engaged in the COBOL programming course and also uh, very knowledgeable about the Zoe project as well. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Newton from IBM. I helped get the project started. I did contributions for about a month, helped do some of the original writing of the beginner book and some of the uh, the content, but since then, I just take care of the back end, and Mike and Hartanto and Joe and others take care of a lot of what's going on now. I'm just a back end person that takes care of the ZOS. I'll turn it over to Hartanto. Um, hi everyone, my name is Hartanto. I'm Phil Susan from Singapore. I was a mentee back in 2021 for the Cobalt Programming course, and I'm now helping around with the projects. And with that, over to you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dean. My name is Joe Winchester. I mostly work on, <clears throat> along with Mike and others, on a project called Zoe. And there's a very uh, plugin for Visual Studio Code called the Zoe Explorer, which is very popular with customers, but it's also very popular with the COBOL course. And um, um, I have a particular slant on KICS or CICS, depending on how you pronounce it. So I'm very much trying to help get. Um, kicks content into the course as well as uh, traditional batch cable. Thanks, thanks, Sadasana. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's a couple of really good points here that we'll talk about, Ray. Um, when we kicked off this new year in 2022, our first quarter, we talked about how, you know, um, skills gap is an issue. Now, is it an issue just for COBOL? No. And that's all, that's when we talked about, and it is still an issue here in manufacturing. I was looking up, um, you know, 2022 skills gap and the Deloitte study from 2021 talks about how manufacturing skills is going, going to have a huge hit by 2030, right? So this article came up on my feed yesterday and was about four strategies to help you close that manufacturing skills gap. So as an, as, as you know, industries are working and looking to um, find out how best to you know fill those skills gap here we are talking about this amazing COBOL programming course from a COBOL perspective is there a skills gap yes we understand that and that is where this programming course comes into play similarly cybersecurity. there are articles abound about how there is a workforce gap and despite all the efforts there's a 26 percent um, gap that has you know in 2022 these articles are very insightful that's why i have the links here if someone wants to check them out um, but the point of talking about this is skills is an issue across many industries and we here with the open mainframe project are doing exactly that addressing how best to fill that skills gap from a cobalt perspective so talking about that so what is the mission of our cobalt programming course when we came together in April 2020, um, this team came together and we were ta talking about what do we really want to do with this programming course, right? It is to attract that next generation of learners to add COBOL 
to the tech toolkit. And I say add COBOL because when we often talk to a lot of our learners, the question is, should I do COBOL or Java or JavaScript or Python? The, the question is not about ors, but it's about making it an and. So that's why we wanted to make sure that we added the fact that it's about adding COBOL to your tech toolkit. And guess what? It truly differentiates you in the marketplace. If you're that next generation young student learning programming and thinking about how to differentiate yourself, think about COBOL and adding it to your tech toolkit, right? And an improved learning experience. And that is exactly what both um, Mike and Joe talked about when they talked about Zoe as a project. We have VS Code, we have Zoe, which is that you know modern interface to the back end that Paul talked about. Um, really bringing the cross environment, cross platform experience. So as a new COBOL learner, you don't have to think about the environment or the platform, but you can learn the language because the tools and the interface is something you're probably already familiar with. And creating an, engage, uh, an engaging, enthusiastic community of learners, which I think we certainly have done in the last two and a half some years, coming up to our third year, April 2023, right? Um, a strong Slack community of over 5,000 learners. And, you know, Mike here will talk a little more about that in a minute. The benefits, as I already said, it truly is a key differentiator in your professional profile. It provides you an ability to work on high visibility projects and, of course, have fun with all of the modern tooling we just talked about. With that, Mike, I know I touched upon a little of, you know, how over the years we've got some course adoption. Love to hear more on how well we've been doing. Yeah, absolutely. One thing to add before I, I jump into course adoption is just one differentiator for our course is the hands-on exercises. You get access to a real Z system. Uh, Paul mentions he just uh, maintains the back end for us now, but that's a that's a huge that's of yeah. huge importance because this gives you actual hands-on learning, which I know for for my for myself anyway, hands-on is the best way best way to learn. A little bit about course adoption is, you know, when we first released the course, um, COBOL was in the news and also a lot of folks were, were programming from home during the pandemic and, and it went viral. Uh, it really did. We had over 100,000 views, I believe, in one month um, early in our endeavors. But I wanted to talk about um, sustained interest in the course. So through our primary channel, we've had over 12,000 downloads of the course PDF, and this is just from our GitHub repository. We also offer down, uh, there, there are also downstream courses where our course has made its way into uh, IBM sites, as well as uh, Coursera and other video instruction links, which maybe some of you have consumed the content uh, through that way. Uh, but this is 12,000 downloads of the course just directly from our uh, GitHub repository. And also our GitHub repository continues to get views. And even in the last uh, two weeks, we've had nearly uh, 2,500 views from over 500 unique visit visitors. And then as far as folks actually doing the hands-on exercises on our course, I, you know, I mentioned possibly more than 12,000 since that was just from our GitHub repo. We've actually had 13,600 IDs issued from learners wanting to access the actual mainframe system that's provided to go through the hands-on exercises. And then as Siddharthna mentioned, uh, for our course Slack channel, we have over 5,000 members and a highly engaged uh, community. I also wanted to mention, too, um, actually, we could go to the next slide here. Um, folks contribute to contribute, continue to contribute to this course, and, and Janos will, will talk a little bit later about his contributions he's made. But since we've posted the COBOL programming course to um, GitHub, we've had over 22 additional contributors um, across the space. So these are oftentimes learners who have, you know, went through the course and offered suggestions along the way, or have come up with new ideas and added added some content to our advanced topics course. What I wanted to touch on here is just we can see that there are 200 folks watching our repository, over 2,000 stars of the repository. If you're interested in contributing, um, you can you know, fork this repository, make code changes, and then open pull requests. We're happy to review those. If you're just interested in you know, taking a look at you know, where are the PD PDFs in the, in the content or how do I get started, you see under the releases section, 2.3, you could click on that and it would take you to the PDFs. There's also instructions at the top 
top level of this repository that talk about how to join our Slack channel and also some of that downstream content I mentioned earlier, such as the, the video courses uh, where a lot of folks uh, get started. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Artanto to talk about some of the more recent updates we've made to the course content. Okay, so we recently completed our uh, summer mentorship for the Open Mainframe project. Uh, we're taking in uh, Sainat Rao from India as our mentee. And with that, we are happy to announce that we are releasing version three of the course, hopefully by the end of this week. If you're watching this on YouTube, there's a chance that the course might be live. So do check our GitHub repository for that. Among some of the major changes that Fashion 3 will bring, we, first of all, we are splitting the first course, the Getting Started course, into two different courses based on user feedbacks. And that will be Course 1, Getting Started, and Course 2, Learning COBOL. And consequently, Course 2 and 3 will be shifted to Course 3 and 4 for the new version. In, it, in addition to that, we also introduced Team Configuration option for SOEV2. This will enable our course taker to connect to the system more easily. And we also add some general fixes and enhancements that our community members have contributed into the course. And lastly, as part of the mentorship program, we also have a new chapter incoming for JSON and XML processing. And that will go into our third course, the advanced topic chapter. And next slide, Susanna. Uh, so the layout of the course remains the same. We're just shifting uh, course one into two different courses, as you can see on the screen here. And next slide. And for the course three, we have a new chapter here, the COBOL for web services, which will contain basically JSON and XML processing in COBOL. And with that, I'm done for the updates. Do check out our GitHub repository for uh, fresh entry coming later this week. Well, one thing I just wanted to highlight there, one piece of feedback we got um, from the most recent release on the course is it took folks a long time or, or too long to get into the learning COBOL content. So we took advantage of a lot of the um, simplified setup that Zoe version 2 offers to sort of streamline that content. So it allows you to get started with the tools much more quickly. Uh, I think we basically cut the instructional material in, in about half um, and start learning COBOL more, more readily. So for folks who um, thought that you know, may have taken uh, a little too long to get started with the tooling. We, we've heard you and hopefully we've addressed that feedback. I'd encourage you to, to give the new content a try and, and see if you agree. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Mike, for pointing that out. Exactly. And, you know, that we are constantly listening to our learner community and to all our course adopters. Um, I think that one in one queue of 2022, the feedback was from Ruin of Bank Data. And I know Bank Data leverages our course content to upskill their incoming mainframe developers, which is such an amazing opportunity for us to work together. And that was feedback that he shared as well. So, um, you know, to Mike's point, we're listening and we will definitely do everything we can to take your community, you know, the community feedback and implement into the course. And what better way than, you know, not just sharing the input, but also coming and doing a fork and sharing your inputs uh, like Giannis has been doing and, you know, sending in some pull requests for us to work together. Yeah. With that, we are excited to have some guest speakers here today who are also learners and contributors of this course, um, COBOL course. So I'd like to give it up, open up to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can um, truly talk and, you know, have fun in a discussion with our guest speakers. So if I can start with you, Liz, a little background and how you got to know about COBOL and the COBOL course, just tell us your journey. <laughs> yeah, so um, I came at this um, probably a little differently than a lot of people who are taking this course. Um, I'm not a student, um, I'm an IT professional. I spent about 15 years of my career doing Linux systems administration, um, having nothing to do with mainframe, nothing to do with COBOL. Um, in fact, when I, when I told some of my friends, you know, from my past 
sysadmin life that I was learning COBOL, they're like, Liz, what are you doing? <laughs> and they thought it was just hilarious that I was I was dabbling with COBOL. Um, and so, but but I joined um, IBM about three and a half years ago um, to specifically work um, on mainframe and mostly the Linux on, on Z system side of things and Linux one. Um, but, you know, I, I kept bumping into COBOL um, in my day-to-day -day work. And I was like, listen, I should probably learn a little bit about this. Um, so I, you know, I knew about the COBOL course. And so I went through it um, about two months ago. Um, and I was, I kind of fell in love with COBOL, which is <laughs> a strange thing to say. I'd never used um, a domain specific language. Um, my history is kind of like, as a sysadmin, I did like, you know, Bash and Perl back in the day, and then it sort of transitioned into Python, a little bit of Go. So my experience with programming, you know, I not a great programmer because I'm more of a systems person, but it, it really has been more like the higher level languages on Linux specifically. Um, but I will say, you know, as someone like me, someone who does systems work, um, I actually have started recommending this course to people um, because of how much insight it allowed me to have into that sort that side of things. So if I was working at a company where I was doing, you know, either like, you know, the middleware or front end or whatever I was doing with my Linux side of things, having a basic understanding of how COBOL is structured um, and, and what kind what the data is going to be looking like in there and how it's manipulated would actually give me a lot of insight and empathy <laughs> um, with the COBOL team. Um, for example, if I was helping write something to, um, you know, something's written in COBOL, it's handling the data processing, and I'm handling the front end of that, like, like or sort of like a middleware piece, um, it may be easier for for me to do certain things in my middleware piece, or it may be easier to do it on the COBOL side. And now that I kind of know, you know, by going through this course, um, what kinds of work is being done on the COBOL side and what COBOL is really, really good for, I can make suggestions um, with the architecture of how we want to go move forward with that and have, you know, somewhat intelligent conversations <laughs> um, with a COBOL team. You know, I'm not a program COBOL programmer now, but I, I do have a fundamental understanding and I'm really grateful for this course for giving me that. Um, I'm also just, you know, generally curious by nature. And so I, one of the things I was thinking of when I was going through this course is that, um, in California, I don't know if other States, but like you, you can, you can now put like a limited subset of emojis on license plates as like part of the, you know, your, your number, you can put like a little heart and there's like a few other ones you can do. And I was going through this course and I know a lot of DMVs use COBOL in the back end. I'm like, wow, that must have been an interesting feature request. <laughs> I could just, I could just like see the conversation that they were having. Like we want to add hearts to license plates and the co COBOL people being like, no. <laughs> and I don't like, I don't know how they ended up supporting that. Maybe that's something that's done in middleware. Maybe they did, you know, add, were able to add something that's not alphanumeric in there. Like it was just, you know, you start, thinking about these interesting problems and, um, you know, it just, it expands your world and it's been a really fascinating journey for me. That's an interesting point. I actually have never thought about how do they do the heart and that DMV probably had to do some code somewhere to, you know, uh, uh, accommodate for those requests. I was going to, I was thinking you're going to suggest that the DMV should say something about COBOL on license plates. <laughs> <laughs> I need a COBOL, awesome. COBOL emoji or something on the license plate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. We'll come back. I mean, you know, um, would love to hear more about your experience with the course itself and any suggestions. But before that, Tiso, talk to us a little about your journey mm -hmm. to mainframes, to COBOL. I know you have a really strong um, mainframe background now as a student. Yeah, um, I actually started with uh, Master the Mainframe Challenges. That's how I got introduced to the mainframes. I did Master the Mainframe 2019 as a 2020 Z ambassador. So from that, I got to love the mainframes based on um, the teachings of Jeff Besti, how he was teaching the mainframes. And I just started digging deeper into the mainframes. I attended um, a lot of events um, on mainframes. Um, I also got to know about the open mainframe project and the open source projects that they have. So from then on, I just I was just learning this and that um, in the mainframes until I met my mentor, um, Kiara Balden, who advised me to learn the COBOL programming language. 
and it was fairly easy to learn compared to other programming languages. I had no struggles with learning it, but uh, maybe I just did the basics. So that's why it wasn't so difficult for me to learn because I haven't got to the advanced concepts yet. But yeah, it wasn't my challenge to learn COBOL. It was fun. It's easy to read and I enjoyed the experience. And also because I got to take the modernized application with IBM Kicks course, uh, it sort of um, showed me how important um, COBOL is in the mainframe space and why we need it as we continue to put the mainframe on hybrid cloud. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tiso. Janos, over to you. Um, please share a little about yourself and your journey. Hello, um, I am Janusz Borgo. I live in Hungary. Hungary is a small country in Europe. Uh, so um, in the late 90s, I saw mainframe at the first time uh, during my summer internship program. I should enter some data from paper into mainframe. The task was not very interesting, but, but, it, it, the, but this mainframe had a rear terminal with a, with a very big keyboard. Also, after, but after graduating from college, I had the opportunity to learn uh, mainframes at uh, Unica company. Unica is one of the largest uh, insurance company in Europe. So I have been uh, working with mainframes for 20 years. I uh, started uh, as a uh, PL1 developer. PL1 is one of the oldest uh, uh, programming languages, but uh, not so old as COBOL. COBOL is, is a bit older. So I, I made on mainframe in PL1 PL1 programs uh, some quality assurance. Uh, so I I solved um, memory issues, memory leak, buffer overflow. And then so on. And, and uh, in the past uh, two years, I, I developed a Java program for me, mainframe two. In the recent years, uh, some of my COBOL developer colleagues uh, retired. That is why I, I started to learn COBOL. I, I took some already two courses, uh, COBOL courses. And uh, I, I, I looked on the internet for all uh, material. Uh, then that, that is how I, I found this, this course, this Open Mainframe project course. And, uh, and it is, I, I found it uh, very, very comprehensive. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, it's very, very good. My, was my first impression, impression. and uh, it is uh, it is uh, interesting too that I, I can log into mainframe uh, machine, IBM mainframe machine for for free. It, it is oh, interesting too, and uh, I, I, I I know COBOL as a very old programming language and the new programming languages. I I know too, so I, I have already a better understanding how the programming languages involved in the during the during the years and uh, the COBOL programs aren't uh, um, black box for me. So I, I made some contributions. I uh, could explain some of my contribution when we. Mm -hmm. We have time have for this. Yeah, absolutely, Janos. Thank you so much for sharing about your, you know, uh, experience so far. And what it, what struck me just listening to our three guest speakers is how unique and different the backgrounds and where they're coming to this course from, and how valuable it has been to all of them. That is truly what I think makes this COBOL programming course. Like I think all of our learners here and our guest speakers already saying, easy to access and you know a, a 
a good way to introduce the language to anyone who is interested in learning, right? From a student to an experienced IT professional to an experienced mainframer. Um, that is what I mean by we have a strong, enthusiastic community of learners, right? Bringing that diverse backgrounds truly has been amazing to watch all of the interaction that happens on that Slack channel as well. So thank you to every one of you, each one of you for exploring the course content here with us. And I know, Janos, you've been a huge contributor of uh, to the course as well. So yes, please do share a little about some of your contributions. And I'm sure Mike is eager to hear, and I'm, Mike has been tracking and approving your PRs. So he's very familiar with your work here too. Yes, yes. Uh, I made a lot of contribution, but uh, those are uh, small changes. Uh, also, uh, should I share my screen or or yeah. should? Yeah, that would be okay. great. So I, I try it. Uh, I think so. Do, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. So uh, this was my full first uh, improvement. I, I put highlighting in documentation some missing point here. Ja corresponding Java code was from one, but Pobo uh, code from from zero one, I, I corrected it and notify statement in GCL uh, delimiter to the end of the in-stream data sets. Here was a, a missing comma in, that is why this program copied one less uh, data set member. Uh, here was, here, uh, he gave us the COBOL program uh, compiler uh, warning because of missing code page. I have uh, completed it. Here, readability improved. Uh, use conditionals where it is possible. SQL error code handling. Uh, so it, it is absolutely. We, we must uh, include a square code handling after every SQL statement in, in PLA, PM and programs. Uh, so also I, I think it, it should be uh, similar to in COBOL program two uh, after uh, every COBOL statement, even SQL code not okay, then, uh, then perform SQL code handling and stop run. Uh, here was uh, this uh, COBOL length, this uh, uh, variable length is, uh, not, was not okay in the documentation. Those uh, variables are four by lengths. Uh, it would correct it. And uh, here I, I added these uh, statements here inside if here here the the index variable uh, is increased but uh, after increasing uh, an index variable it should be checked of it's uh, okay or or not what is it is uh, over the limit of the array or not it can should easily uh, so can be easily make uh, uh, harder to find errors. But it, I corrected it. Uh, uh, and okay, these are my committed committed contribution. I I, I think I, I improved the COBOL course a little bit. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you, Janos. As I said, I mean. Joe, Paul, Mike, do chime in. I mean, these are amazing, awesome contributions. Thank you, Janos, for- I, I, absolutely, just... I absolutely love the over limit contribution. That's a good one. That's a technique that everybody should be using if they're not. That was an excellent one. So, as, as, a, as a quality assurance uh, uh, programmer, I had uh, to learn all of the, um, 
quality issues, memory issues in, in our PL1 program. If a PL1 developer colleague may make a quality issue, makes a quality issue, I, I should find it. I, and then I, I have experience with that quality issues. Some of them are I, uh, harder to find, but we, we must uh, find it. Mm -hmm. um, so Janos, if you want to just stop sharing your screen, we can look at each other again here. Um, okay. If I could just, you know, uh, moment here, go back to Liz. How can I? Um, there should be a stop share right there at the top. Where you are uh, well, uh, I am very new in. Uh, how, how can I start? It might be a uh, drop down from the top. Stop share. Okay. okay. Yes, there right there on the top. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. We use MS Teams. At, thank at you, thank company. you, Janos. So if I could just jump back over to Liz, right, Liz? I know as you were doing the course, you had some ideas or you know um, feedback as well. Uh, with the content. So would love to hear some of your thoughts on the course and, you know, what what updates or feedback you have. Yeah, so I I just want to say the, um, I, I really like the approach that the course took um, to the, the, the labs, um, because one of the things that I see a lot in introduction to programming courses is they will share a bunch of concepts and then they'd be like, okay, now write this program from scratch that does this thing. And usually that's about where I'm like, mm, I'm going to go do this later <laughs> because writing a program from scratch is um, it's, it's hard and it can be a little daunting for a program like a language. I mean, anything beyond hello world, hello world, pretty straightforward. But when you start manipulating data and doing stuff. So one of the things that this course does is they instead have you debug code and also make changes to existing code. And one of the things that I, I loved about that one, that's way easier. <laughs> Um, and so like, I, I wasn't intimidated by that. And it, it encouraged me to complete the course because I was getting these little wins here and there. I was like, oh, I know what's wrong. And then I could fix it. And then you feel good. And then it moves you on. And so it really pulled me into the course. Um, so from a motivation perspective, it was really good. Um, but as I thought about it, the other point is that like, that's how you interact with COBOL code in the real world too. Um, especially as a junior programmer, you're going to start out by debugging code and changing how data is manipulated in existing code and eventually i mean there's you know we there we have the um there's lots and lots of cobalt still being written so there is still a lot of that to do um but debugging yeah and changing is what you're going to do in the real world so i love that that was the approach um so so thank you for that it's it's really it's really good um and i yeah it's you know i i actually went through the coursera version of this um so really the only the only things were that you know some of the data set names have changed slightly i think and like the uh um it wasn't i was trying to think i think it was you know just some of the output um in vs code has changed slightly um from when those videos were done so i think those are just a little outdated um but it was it was still pretty straightforward to figure out um what was going on for me anyway um so yeah, no, I just I I loved going through it and it was it was really good. Um, so yeah, I I I I was seeing Paul, you know, all smiles when you were talking about you know those code code snippets being there and being able to just look for issues and fixing and getting those quick wins. So huge round of applause. Thank you, Paul, for taking that approach and strategy to introducing you know COBOL to new learners. That was way back. And all of this was done in less than six weeks by Paul over here. So wow. <laughs> and by the way, Liz said something very early on that I was very impressed by why she decided to do it. But a lot of people claim to be full stack developers, and I don't consider them full stack developers. She's on this journey to learn everything end to end. <laughs> and I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. That is such an amazing insight to how and why the course was easier, easy to, I mean, I, I know COBOL is always set, talked about as easy to read, easy to learn, but that was insightful. Thank you for sharing that. Tiso, any additional, um, any thoughts about the course itself, you know, um, and would you be able to maybe compare and contrast as a student 
COBOL with other programming languages that you learn for your curriculum? And what would your takeaways be? Um, I'll have to agree with Liz about um, the, the course being easy to learn, considering the fact that you have labs at the end of um, each tutorial. So that makes it easier to learn where you just go and debug the already existing program. So that made it much fun and you get to apply the knowledge that you have learned immediately. Yeah, so that yep. that was okay with the course compared to the other courses that I've done before. Um, I've learned JavaScript where you get to develop APIs straight from scratch. So that was kind of hard because now you have to develop a whole new program from scratch and sometimes it i don't know it drains you of energy you don't want to do that when you're starting out learning and you end up just leaving the the course completely so yeah compared to uh, other programming languages like javascript i'd say cobol is much easier to learn and also as i've mentioned that i haven't dived into the more advanced concepts where you gotta develop things like apis or develop programs from scratch so I already know exactly how to compare it with JavaScript, but so far it's much easier to learn compared to that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any Anybody else have any uh, questions for our guest speakers? I know. I think, Joe, you're going for, yes. <laughs> so you're reading, you could see my hand moving over the map. Yeah, I mean, awesome. All three of you, if you're doing it, I have a good question for Liz. I really like the idea that you you wanted to do it as a. It's almost like you approach it as a be more empathetic. Um, you know, learn COBOL from a sysprog point of view. I wondered if you think should there be something for people in the course who don't understand the sysprog side for them to perhaps come over to the sysprog domain. Um, you know, so it becomes a two way, uh, two way sort of sharing experience. Yeah, um, I mean, definitely. <laughs> um, and it's probably outside the scope of this course, because um, it's going the other direction. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I love the idea of cross training within an organization and building out those skills. Um, because it does help the teams work better together. And it's less like, oh, do this. And they're like, oh, it's gonna take six weeks. Why would that take six weeks? And like, just understanding more about each other's um, domains. Like I just I'm a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, whether it's something that this group expands on and, and does or something else in the open mainframe project, um, I think that would be really interesting. And I'd totally take that one too. <laughs> okay. I've got one other question. It's more of a general question to all three of you is that quite a lot of modern languages, um, I say modern, you know, everything from Java, you know, JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, they're all package manager based. Uh, often when you start constructing something, you end up writing a little bit of code and importing an awful lot of somebody else's code um, that and the code that you import might import somebody else's and so on and so forth. It becomes almost like a just a recursive build exercise. And that has benefits for modularity and reuse. It has downsides for sort of vulnerability and knowing the provenance of that software. Um, and there's been some quite high profile things recently, whereas COBOL takes a very different approach. It's very much just what you see is what you compile is what you get. I don't know if anybody has noticed that or thinks that there's a that's a good thing or a bad thing or um... yeah, I mean, I think that I mean the I think that the crux of the thing here is that COBOL is is designed to do very specific things and so they can get mm -hmm. away with that. <laughs> um, in the world of you know Python and Go and Java with these package systems, like it's I, I found that like most of my learning of those languages was learning what was already out there so I didn't have to rewrite something and still I would you know submit a pull request to a project and someone would be like why didn't you just use this library and I'm like well I didn't know it existed okay. um and so like I it, it makes those languages a lot harder and because they're you know multi-purpose so there's a lot of stuff out there um so yeah my thoughts mm -hmm. Uh, I, I prefer the modern programming languages such as Java. 
in, in the, I, I can develop in Java code more, more easily and quickly, but it's, it's cost um, naturally. I mean, in, it is harder to crack uh, uh, into mainframe machines. Uh, machines, but I, I, I prefer Java. I, uh, I have wrote a program, find prime numbers uh, um, till, uh, until 1 million in COBOL and the Java, but in, in Java, Java is, is was it easier and a little bit performant. Okay. Thank you. Interesting. Now, one comment that I'll make, I've always, I'm now beginning to profess that a great programmer is not someone that really understands all the verbs and everything from a particular language. I believe a great programmer is one that knows many different programming languages and knows exactly which language to apply where. And that's what we're missing these days. Uh, you shouldn't use Java for batch of millions and millions of records. You shouldn't use COBOL for internet traffic. And so you gotta know which languages serve its purpose and how to use the language in the best situations. If somebody knows Java and they apply Java to everything, that's a problem. So in my opinion, a great programmer gets familiar with all the different languages. And as Liz was saying, she was getting more insight as to, oh, now that I understand COBOL, I understand somebody could do something on the back end that could make this very easy on the front end. And that's exactly what great programmers, I think, are. They understand the differences in the strengths and weaknesses of each language. Yeah, that's one yeah, of the they, things I find really funny about like the language wars. I'm like, you guys are asking the wrong question. <laughs> and the other thing, Paul, to your point about full stack. So I work with quite a lot of customers who have a lot of COBOL that's very good for doing the data manipulation, very good for doing their throughput. But once they come to a, perhaps a mobile client on the front end of that, there's quite a rich stack of technology between that. Um, they might perhaps have some Java um, runnings, perhaps some Tomcat or something, creating some REST APIs, and they might perhaps have a TypeScript uh, front end using some libraries. And the, the value to being able to understand all of that scope from an architectural point of view, and especially when you're dealing with like something broke or something's going slowly, um, how to understand that is very, very powerful uh, for everybody um, in an organization. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't want to start a language war by doing that, but definitely it, it's great to see you all reaching out. And Cobalt has a huge important place. I mean, you touched on this at the start, Sudarshana, but I talk to companies and 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 they're increasing their COBOL usage, and they are, especially through microservices. And and you know, they're not it's not COBOL everywhere and it's not Java everywhere. It's a real blend, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, I think that's why we captured that even in our mission for the course, right? It is about adding COBOL to your tech toolkit. So we're definitely not telling anybody here that COBOL is the end all be all, you know, and you have to learn COBOL and that's all you need to do. It's absolutely learning all of these different languages, understanding what suits best for which situation. And, um, you know, to Liz's point, doing this with empathy. <laughs> Right, understanding the the whole spectrum. I think when we were developing the course, or I don't know when, but Paul, we've had these conversations often, right? About how um, from a sysprog's world, it's about application developers just mess the machine up. They don't know how to use the resources. So I, I think we've had those conversations and that goes well with what Liz was pointing out. If application developers could understand a little bit about you know, the actual infrastructure, resource handling and such, and sysprogs could understand what application developers are trying to do. I think that that conversation there would be um, really insightful, educational, and truly make it uh, a much happier place. <laughs> and, and many developers do not care about performance and capacity, but somebody's got to write the check for some more capacity. And when people, if, if put it this way, if they took got rid of all Java and and the and and 
replaced all COBOL with Java for batch processing, IBM would make a fortune. We would sell them so much hardware, it would be unbelievable. You know, so it's silly to, you know, um, to not understand that there is performance and capacity implications and developers many times don't care, but they should. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here we are, this is our 4Q, which means we're coming to close 2022, December, unbelievable, another year just went by, but that also means we're looking ahead and forward to 2023. So as folks who have taken this course and have insights to, you know, COBOL now, any ideas and suggestions for us? And I'm opening this up to, you know, Liz, Tiso, Janos, for how can we add, what content can we add? How can we improve the course? What would make this even better for our learners out there? Ideas? Uh, as, as I mentioned before with this big session, I had some ideas. Uh, can, can I share my ideas? Sorry. Yeah, uh, do you see my screen? It's coming up, yes. Yes, also, I, I could uh, make uh, uh, some, some much of my ideas uh, in person, but but that there is a lot of uh, ongoing uh, requests. Here, uh, first, uh, do you see here, creative statement, uh, COBOL program, here uh, should uh, same, not null, here is the variable, here, 25, 20, it, it should, uh, Fixed. The, the, these are small changes. The, this would be no more changes. Uh, I would use uh, uh, indicator variables but at uh, fetch statement, or would I, I define these all, all all the columns with uh, with uh, null no. Uh, I would uh, rename this table with. Uh, very much a hash mark to, for example, customers. I think it is it would be doable because all of the tables has no name namespace. And the compiling here here the bind give us return code four. Uh, I would correct it so so would bind give us return code null but warning I did this is this uh, question mark aren't uh, the correction here I am not a DB2 administrator I uh, couldn't find a better solution for for this warning yeah, in the do documentation uh, is uh, that uh, Currently, um, the Zoe Explorer isn't uh, can uh, execute TBS to SQL statements interactively. For this, uh, there there is uh, some possibilities in, in with GCL on mainframe, or that the, for this functionality there are some free tools, DB Visualizer free, and SQL SQL, for example. I prefer DB Visualizer, but this squirrel is, is very nice. And for this uh, function, we do need uh, connection parameters. There are some typos. Um, on that, just to jump in on that on that last slide, if you go back one um, to the DB2 so, execution first. Yeah, one one thing we could do here is if um, if the DB2 server on the mainframe instance we have, if we had ran it as DB2 connect activated, we could use the Zoe CLI DB2 plugin in the course, which is free as well. We could execute SQL directly through the command line. Could be yeah, another, and another option. Yeah, the other thing, Mike, is that the DB2 for the DB2 for ZOS developer plugin that's free as well. Um, you're right, that would have to have the DB2 connect enabled. But yeah, great points, Janos. Yeah, let's pick up on this. And Mike's one but, about the C, yeah. Uh, but I, I don't know the connection parameters. Okay, yeah, well, we, would, we, we can handle this. 
Yeah, we'd have to figure that. We'd have to work with work with Paul and others to figure oh, that out. In, in fact, that's actually pretty easy. Somebody can get on the system and just do a dash dbcg display ddf, and um, that command gives you all of the connection information you would need once we have the driver available. And the, the key is getting that driver available. Um, and the, we can do it, as you were saying, Mike, we can do it on the host side so that each um, license doesn't have to be down on the workstation side. But there is a command that can be issued that would give you all the, the connection information, the port number, the location, which is also known as the database name, and uh, uh, other things. So that's easily found out. Thank you. Uh, I uh, made a endless loop on this mainframe, I could cancel it, but uh, but I had uh, already some problems with end endless loop at my company. Some years ago, I should call my uh, system administrator in the middle of the night because of an endless loop. <laughs> but I, it, it was, all, I, I don't know of, if, if this uh, real problem on this mainframe when it uh, would be a real problem, we should um, put a time parameter in jobs here one minute or, or something like this. When it is not a real problem, then, then okay. Yeah, this is Paul. Uh, I think that what I can do is on all of the initiators, I can, I need to look at the time, the default time value. And if I have it unlimited, I need to make it small. So that's something I'm going to write down right now, because uh, there's just something I can do about that almost immediately. So, so you, 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 you uh, can use un, if you're in a loop, you'll eventually get an ab end if you take up too much time. Uh, so that's you you can set this parameter in global. Yes, it can be a global behavior type of parameter. So I'll look into that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. Here, I, I sometimes I have uh, too much uh, uh, that files in uh, as SDSF output queue and I can't purge it. I am not authorized for that, um, but I didn't, when, when, when it would be possible, then it would be okay, when not possible, then. That is uh, also easy enough to fix. I can, I just got your ID there and I can just go look for the there's no reason why people should not be able to purge their own output. And so mm -hmm. I can go in there and do a rack F command to let anybody purge the output that they own. So I will look into that too. That's something I can take on immediately. And uh, my last slide, uh, I, I found this abandon analyzer for mainframe. This is a visual code plugin. Um, it, I, I would uh, try it if it would be uh, possible, but I, I don't know. And uh, for this, I would need the connection parameters. Maybe, maybe it is outside the scope of this course, but I, um, I would so, try it. So no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see this. Uh, this is a Broadcom's Visual Studio Code plugin have an analyzer for mainframe. The back end for this particular product is um, to sim dump um, kicks or, or, or batch, depending on, on what you're using. Um, so you need to connect it to uh, sim dump actually version 11 for this to work. Um, currently, the course is running on a system um, provided by IBM, and I think there, there's particular reasons we can't get the, that back end on this system. But one thing we're looking at and keeping in mind going forward um, is there is a contribution um, of a Z system to the open mainframe project. And maybe when that goes through, uh, we would be able to put the back end for this particular um, for this particular Visual Studio Code extension on that system and somehow include it in the course. I don't know, Paul, do you have anything to add on that? You think that's a good path forward? Oh yeah, I, it, it is. So we, we just got to, as you know, um, if we open it up, do we open it to everyone? Then we've got vendors raining on us. Right, so right. that's the only thing we got to worry about. So we need to talk it through. I would, I think it's wonderful to do it, but 
having vendors put all their products on there and then we need support and it could be you know we need to put um we need to put some parameters around it if you will yeah it'll be interesting how the contribution works out to omp and how they're staffing the maintenance of that system etc yeah. so uh so so right now this isn't uh, an immediate possibility for our course to include um but uh, if you're interested in learning more about this particular extension, um, I don't know about providing a live system, but if, you're, if anyone's listening to this call interested in more about this extension, you just feel, feel free to send me an email and I will get you in touch with the appropriate people. Uh, my email uh, would be michael.bauer, the number two at broadcom.com. Um, and we can help you out either with, um, and we certainly provide a demonstration um, and we might have some tooling within Broadcom where we could provide you with a with a hands-on experience for this particular solution, sort of outside the scope of this course. Um, that, that's how I would recommend moving forward if, if you're interested in this this extension. Uh, do, do, do I find your email address on uh, GitHub? You might put it in the chat, Mike. Yeah, okay, I'll put it in the chat. You. Yep, yep. Thank yeah, you. It's also it's also connected to my GitHub account either, either way. But yeah, I'll, I'll drop it in here. Thank you so much, Janos. I did steal the screen from you, but those were great, great ideas and suggestions. If you could send me your um, deck as well, so we capture all of those, and I'm sure you'll, you know, I bring those in as issues and PRs into the course itself, which would be even better. Thank you, thank you. But I did want to give Liz and Tiso a couple of minutes here too. We're coming close to the top of the hour. Any other ideas, suggestions for the course? I think Liz, you mentioned um one already from a sysprog's point of view kind of a a recommendation but any other ideas not really <laughs> i mean this is this is a great course and i i you've done a remarkable job good job team <laughs> awesome 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 um so i'd like to tiso anything sorry didn't mean to cut you off if you're going to say something nah I'm satisfied with the way the course is. Okay, all right, and we'll continue. And I know Joe at the opening already talked about how he has a, a, a lean to kicks CICS. And that has been something our course has been exploring and we'll continue to explore because bringing that middleware interaction and you know giving our learners that complete experience of doing a transaction is something that we would definitely love to explore and add to this course. So stay tuned um, because we will definitely share more about that as we learn more as well. In the meantime, these are some of our COBOL learning resources. You heard Liz talk about she took the video course on Coursera. So I just wanted to talk about these as a few downstream projects, which are also um, other forms of learning, basically the same content you see here on our GitHub at Open Mainframe project. And um, a couple other resources as well. There's a COBOL resource hub over on developer.ibm.com. Again, Liz leads the, you know, leads that project in the sense of keeping all the content there refreshed, updated. So um, that is another good resource to check out. And our COBOL Fridays webinar series that we did back in 2020. But the content there is still pretty relevant and up to date in, um, you know, in terms of the content that was presented for someone who's getting started using this course. The, the Fr Cobalt Friday series is a really good supplemental um, learning content, if you will. And Paul here on this call was pivotal to um, that webinar series. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. And um, for anyone who's listening into this and one is wondering how to get started and stay connected, of course, we would love to hear from you on your contributions you heard today from Janos, who has done several contributions and has great ideas. So bring those ideas over to the course, right? Help us implement that next generation of content. And if you are an existing COBOLer and SME, um, we would love for you to be part of our, our COBOL Slack channel as well to really guide that community of learners that we've been talking about, a rich, diverse community, really enthusiastic um, to learn. So there are, these are some ways that you can definitely help us out. Anything else in closing? 
Mike, Joe, Paul, our speakers, our Tanto's been super quiet. No. <laughs> You'll Tonto understand a lot quiet. of old computer jokes after learning a bit about COBOL. That's been the best part. <laughs> I know what an A-bend is. <laughs> Tonto may be quiet, but the amount of work he does is amazing. He helps me a ton on the back end. Yes. Even on the weekends. And our Tonto knows that. That's one thing we always say about our Tonto. I don't know how he does it, but he's there everywhere. He's He's on the COBOL course, he's on IBM Z Explorer, he's on IBM Community. He catches everything, he'll email, he'll Slack. I yes, don't know I, if he sleeps. I think you heard <laughs> it is midnight there in Singapore, so I guess he does it's not. It's 2 a.m. here. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, everyone. Oh, and yeah. wishes for a very, very happy and safe and relaxing holiday season to one and all. And we look forward to bringing you even more bigger, better COBOL updates. Stay tuned and we'll work together in 2023. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks. Hey. Thanks. Thanks team. Great job.